Okay. That's fine. Then if we say something wrong, we can, I can cut it later. Yes, no problems. Uh, so I love your microphone. You're all set up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah, I mean, this obviously, when I'm delivering feedbacks and things like that, you know what it's like. It's, it's nice for it to sound relatively crisp when people get their feedback. And then I obviously did the did put a few podcasts in, in the past and, and things like that. So it pays to have a, a decent setup. Yeah, totally. Oh, I can see. So um, I'm really glad for this podcast. Actually, a lot of people ask me to have you uh, on the channel. And th the main problem is for Italian, obviously, the language. So I'll try to subs all the video so that okay. people, everybody can understand. And basically, you are you have a lot of Italian fans. I don't know if you are <laughs> aware sure. of that. I, um, I, I see people reshare it with Italian, reshare a lot of my, uh, my Instagram posts. Yeah. Uh, um, but it's, it's hard. You know what it's like when your social gets a little bit bigger. It's, it's hard to know who's actually following you. Yeah. Um, but that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, that's, that's it. I, I see a lot of people when, when I see people live, they came by and they start talking about their, themselves. And then I realize that they are that specific person in Instagram. Like uh, uh, I can ah, see yes. the, the, the profile picture, you know? Yes. And then in the middle of the conversation, I'm like, oh, you are that guy. Oh, I know you. <laughs> and it's <laughs> yeah. so strange because they know you so well and you know nothing about them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I know what you mean, basically. Yeah. Um, so uh, to start, <laughs> you obviously you are um, quite well known, in, uh, especially in the natural bodybuilding environment. So I would like you to introduce yourself and talk a, a little bit about you. Sure, absolutely. So I am 26 years old. I've been in, involved in, in the fitness industry since about 2013, 2014. So I'm coming up to about a decade involved in, in coaching of, of some sort. Um, my original sort of passion for, for sports itself was actually built within motorsport. I raced carts from a very young age all across the UK and a little bit in Europe, Italy actually as well. And I wanted to definitely make that my career, but it ended up being limited from a financial standpoint. So I I wanted something where I could compete, but I wasn't going to get potentially beaten by people with a little bit more money, um, or at least people wouldn't progress faster than me if they had more money. So for me, I already loved the, the fitness aspect of, of what I was doing for motorsport. So I was training a little bit more cardiovascular work, but still some strength work. So that's how I got into bodybuilding was yeah. sort of the strength, the strength aspect of, uh, of the motorsport. And, um, and then from there, you know, it was, it was quite a, a quick transition into moving into my, my first ever contest prep. I, I pretty much did my first prep out of about of maybe a year of, of really proper training, maybe a year and a half at a push. I dieted down for my first show, which is a teenage show. And then I literally from, from there just got, got the absolute buzz. I, I was always in my head. I, I knew the difference between when I started bodybuilding, I knew that, the difference between what it would be to be a natural bodybuilder and what it would be to be an enhanced bodybuilder. I knew that very well. Like I was uh, luckily enough, I was introduced to the right people at the right time to have that perception. So I knew what natural bodybuilding was. I knew what assisted bodybuilding was. And I think actually there's a, a still, a, 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 still a lot of people find that hard to distinguish. Not enough people know about natural bodybuilding. People think that most of bodybuilding is assisted um, the natural community is still being built um, and it still needs a lot more awareness. So, but luckily enough, I, like I said, introduced the right people. Um, my plan long-term was like, right, I want to do one natural show and then, and then go assisted because I just love the look of the assisted guys. Um, and then I went to this natural show. I, I saw some of the guys that were winning the classes and like the men's, the men's open and uh, I was like, you know what, actually, I'd, 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 I'd be quite happy looking like that um, if I could try and pursue that level of muscle um, and I could do it drug free. I'd, I'd be more than content. And then, you know, obviously almost 10 years later, I'm, I'm pretty much, at the, the, you know, closing in on, on some of those guys that I was looking at, yeah. you know, um, and, and that's that's pretty, pretty cool. And as a journey, I've, I've, I've very much loved being uh, sort of on this uh, yeah, drug free bodybuilding journey, building 
obviously my brand pretty much around drug free bodybuilding. Um, and that's then what has led to team MBM, which was my coaching brand, which is the longest running since like 2014, 2015. Um, and then of course now the branches, which is the clothing, the membership site, and you know, yourself, all of these branches that can form yeah. off, uh, off your bodyboarding journey. So, um, but yeah, I feel like I'm still at the, the very initial stages of doing some of these, these things that I want to do. Um, but I guess my main goal is for me to be remembered as a really good athlete, but also to be remembered as making a massive impact on natural bodybuilding. That's kind of like me and my goals. Yeah. That, that's amazing. That's amazing. So um, to give you some context, in Italy, actually, the natural bodybuilding is quite famous. We have a lot of good natural athletes uh, and there are a lot of content about natural bodybuilding. The point is that I think we have some misconception around natural bodybuilding so right. that the thing is, it's like uh, for people, it's something completely completely different than assisted bodybuilding so that you have to train in totally another way you have to diet down in totally another way and you have to do things like completely different that's why you are really well known because people in Italy are looking at you and seeing oh my god he's natural and he's lifting six is that six and a half plates on a squat I've seen last video <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or the cybex yeah so it's like <laughs> Oh my God. And he's training to failure. So he's natural and he's going to failure. It's something really strange for Italian conception. So I really like you to, uh, to talk. And, and I'm thinking, so you started the first uh, competition and then obviously you decide to remain natural and try to reach that physique. Yes. What did you do to reach it? Sure. So uh, that's interesting that perception i think that um it's yeah it's, I mean, it's definitely uh, so, very sorry yeah i mean all the errors also you've done yeah so how your training your diet evolves around the uh everything yeah yeah for sure so for context in 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 you know when i i got into training i was i was introduced to uh uh, the logbook and the progressive overload setup of training very 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 much straight away um my coach at the time was uh, the only coach that I've actually really ever had, to be honest, um, was, was very big on, on, you know, being aware of, 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 you know, what you were doing in the gym, logging it, having uh, some degree of progressions. And uh, I was in a gym with uh, a few people that were training very hard and were also very strong. Um, and it was, it was late 2014 after my first contest where I, I spotted someone in the gym wearing like a, a train by JP hoodie. Yeah. And uh, it was it was very it was one of the first JP hoodies that ever got released. It, the old logo and everything. It was I've never seen anyone wear one since. And uh, I, so I looked it up and I I found the site. I think this is like maybe early 2015. I became a member on that site, and then that kind of changed the game for me completely because <clears throat> at that point it, during 2013 2014 I had really no perception in terms of how to manage training volume and how to manage my split. I just go in and kind of train what wasn't sore, um, which worked well for a, for a while. But when it became a case of, okay, I was logging my training now, but I'm training also with a lot of intuition. The intuition wasn't enough for me to keep progressing. So I needed to have a little bit more like skill and overall thought process with my programming. So I followed the site. And I got a little bit more of a perception. Okay, right. This, this, this now makes a little bit more sense. I'm going to set my sessions up in a way where I know I can recover from workout to workout. And then my progression as a result of reducing my volume slightly and just making things set up in a little bit more of a strategic way, just it skyrocketed. So I was like, right, this is, this is, this is working. I'm, I'm getting a lot, lot stronger. I'm, I'm taking things closer to failure. Um, I think in that year as well, 2015, 2016, I, um, I realized I was like this gym that I was training in, I'd kind of outgrown it. Like the dumbbells were up to 50 kilos maximum. So there were some things that I was running out of room for, not so much presses because I've never been a crazy strong presser, but the, the pulls and the leg movements, I was running out of room on some of the machines. So I changed gyms and I started to try and just train with people that were doing crazy shit. <laughs> so 
if I saw someone do crazy shit, I'd, I'd kind of like follow them on Instagram. I'd ask them some questions about how they trained and maybe ask if I could jump in for a session. Um, and I did that pretty continuously throughout 15 and 16. And uh, again, just took another step forwards because I believe that surrounding, my, surrounding myself with those kind of people developed what was, uh, what was training skill, you know, my ability to actually train harder. And this is one of the biggest tips and, and bit of advice that I give to a lot of younger people nowadays is if you want to be able to train harder, go and train with someone who can train harder than you. Uh, watch how they approach sets, watch how they warm up, watch everything they do and take something from it and then apply it to your sessions and you'll inevitably get something out of it and it'd be, be stronger yourself. Um, so then, yeah, over the course of time, my really from like 16 onwards, my split stayed pretty similar, some form of like push ball leg hybrid um, and relatively low volume training and, and log booking and trying to progress. Um, you know, inevitably, obviously, through my several contest preps, I, you know, played about with some slightly different things and, you know, learned how to learn what was not a good way to train during a diet and learned that at some point I couldn't really squat so well and that hacks were better. You know, I learned little things along the way. But the majority of like my training when I was getting started was getting to learn how to train harder and doing really basic stuff in the gym with a gym that was full of people that trained hard, but wasn't crazy well. Um, you know, so I think that that was something that was big for me initially was getting good at, at some of the most basic stuff and, and learning how to take things to complete failure. Um, you mentioned nutrition. So for me, when I started, I, I again got introduced to, to tracking macros um so i had an awareness of, of how to build a diet sorry I, I like to talk about nutrition a little bit later i like oh, to ask yeah, the, no during that way uh have you ever thought like because you've you've been surrounded by all people you ask them to train with you uh yes. and all this kind of stuff is that with natural and enhanced guys both both 100 so you it's see like, some, in, someone that is pushing in the gym i have to train with him that's period yeah it, and in fact yeah. one of the big one of the one of the things that i i always had the same mindset throughout my entire training career like i never even thought oh he's assisted or he's not assisted i didn't care i just thought he's strong i want to know why he's strong i i didn't didn't have this like crazy identity crisis of forming relationships with only natural people or i'm natural so i can't keep up with this assisted dude um i think that is a massive limitation for natural athletes that they almost feel like they have this uh crown that they should be wearing on their head because they're natural and oh i can do this and i'm natural i don't, I don't care you know if you're natural and strong if you're assisted and strong you're both strong you're both doing a great job at whatever you're doing in the gym um so if anything i think i probably trained with a lot more assisted guys than i did naturals um because it, it opened up my mind to what the human body was capable of and yes they have a little help here and there but the human body is still capable of that in some instance so opening up my mind to that was a was a huge thing yeah so i, I can see you you are training actually really really hard and more uh, I think harder than most of enhanced guys, to be honest. So I, I can appreciate see it. <laughs> if you think yeah. so. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. I really enjoy uh, watching your videos on Instagram. There's almost one set, but uh, watching that set before I, I step into the gym, it's like, oh my God, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's amazing. Um, so uh, talking, still talking about training, um, you are using like a progressive overload uh, style of training for yes. all these years still now yes yes yeah 100 percent. i mean of course I, I i learned over the course of of the years of progressive overload that you know progressive overload comes in so many shapes and forms and you know i wasn't i, I haven't always just focused on all right i have to add weight or i have to add reps every single time especially as i got stronger i realized that Sometimes it's okay to take maybe a couple of steps back in order to improve the way that I perform a movement. And I even do this to this day right now, you know, there's several movements where I get, I always get carried away with the logbook. Um, but I love training like that. I love seeing the limits. I love doing sets and looking back at them and thinking, yeah, I moved that way. I didn't move it that well, but 
I, I was staying safe. I was still performing the exercise with no pain or discomfort, but I challenged myself because fucking hell, like the reason why I get into the gym is because I want to challenge myself. I don't want to look like I'm doing like filming an exercise library for my client. So I want to look like I'm actually trying to create a novel stimulus. Um, so, you know, my, my training often gets slack on Instagram for not looking a certain way or for not looking like perfect. Um, and you know, that's just because I am trying to test the limits of what I can do. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm not afraid to show that either. I'm not afraid to put up a set that I wasn't completely happy with on Instagram. Um, because I think that often people post sets when they're only, they're only perf, they're only perfect or that they're happy with them or that they got the seal of approval from some other people that know a lot about the human body. Um, you know, I think that's, that's fun fine you know if that's the way they want to operate but for me i want to show a true picture of what hard training looks like which is you know there's never to be going to be some steps which you need to maybe tidy up next time a little bit yeah. um but yeah I, you know a progressive overload for me has always been there and it's the way that i it's the way that i really i think a lot of my passion was formed for training because i've always been competitive since i was young so my competition is my logbook every time i go into the gym um, it makes it a competition for me. It makes it a challenge. Um, and if I don't have that, I, I struggle a little bit with, with knowing what, what my actual purpose is in, in the gym. <laughs> uh, I totally understand that. Uh, hmm. I think uh, uh, that heavy load set are not mean to be perfect as a, an exercise library video. It's not possible because yeah. you have a weight that is so much uh, heavy that, uh, I mean, also the physics that is around that, the gravity and all this stuff, you can't be as perfect. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine a row, you have a machine that may, you know, shake a little bit because of the weight. So everything changed. So it's not supposed to be as an exercise, but it's okay mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, fast the tempo a little bit sometimes, mm -hmm. or uh, to, you know, it's okay to not go so much deep Yes. And because we are talking not to do half squat, we are talking about like uh, mm. 10 degrees angle. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So it's okay. And I, I think the beauty of this is to, to see how to push things harder. You have to find a compromise and then go back on the form. It's part Agreed. of the process because you have to feel uh, the load, to, to push the load. When you are strong as you are, you, to push further you have to feel the new load yeah, and, and your brain, your brain has to accept it, you know, because the feeling I've seen it, the feeling when you uh, push the six plate on the cybex and you feel on the shoulder, six plate, it's, oh, <laughs> it's, that's it. Okay. I, I can't do this. I can't. Yeah. And uh, the brain has to said, and I always said that the real eight uh, uh, RM. So the, the maximum weight to do a reps on legs, from the first rep, you have to shake a little bit. That's the real ATM. So yeah. and, and if you're not used to it, when you shake, you think, oh, I, I just have one, two reps, but you have eight reps ahead. So you have to, you know, understand that, to feel that. Yes. So that, that, that's, that's the point. That's really cool. Um, so because uh, in Italy, we don't, uh, people don't talk that much about progressive overload style of training, especially natural bodybuilding. Uh, by the way, in Italy, natural bodybuilding is most uh, like high volume uh, or buffer and the buffer is RIR. Right. Yep. Reps in reserve. Yeah. And you touch failure just sometimes because you can't recover if you're natural. Uh, but you do a lot of volume. That is my misunderstanding in my point of view it's like the volume is what taxes you the most in terms yes. of recovery so sure. um when we when you like can you walk us through uh your i don't know your legs workout sure. typical regs workout to understand you know the set the volume how you structure it yeah of course so typical leg workout at present will be starting with some form of curl variation uh, whether it be seated or lying, typically lying. So if I've got a seated, it tends to be on my, my pull days. If I top up the extra work on hamstrings with those, so probably a lying hand curl, I'll do two working sets there. One typically like in a lower rep range and one is slightly higher. So like eight to 10, maybe 11 to 15, something of that sort. So two work sets. And then I'll head over to 
uh, immediately into into my squat variation for the day, which is at the moment typically cybex hack squatting. Um, I've played about with barber back squats, played about with Smith squats, and I can't seem to get that same feeling across into my deadlifts that feels good enough to pull the numbers that I want to pull. Uh, my hips are too sore, my lower back's too sore. The hack for me is a comfortable home. I can get a lot of knee flexion um, and I can protect my back, my lower back for, for the preceding days. Um, so hack squat will be one set. It'll be one set. And, and I'll just, uh, on the day itself and maybe the day prior, I'll be thinking about what, what I did last time. And then I'll be trying to form an idea in my head of, okay, what, what is the goal for today? So if last time I took something that was maybe like a five repper or a four repper, something very low, I know that I'll probably end up going eight to 12 for the next session. Just because if I run it, if I run like four reps, four reps, four reps, four reps, and keep increasing the load or staying at that very high load exposure, my nervous system just eventually says no. Um, and my sleep quality suffers, my appetite is down, all of these things that indicate that I'm very sympathetically dominant uh, come into play. And, and then the cascade of events is that the other sessions take a hit. So one set on the hack, again, decide on the rep range based on what happened in the last session, <clears throat> typically two sets of a leg press. And I will either use, so the hack squat, obviously we've challenged the quads and primarily in their length and position. Um, we then move across to a leg press where I typically top band it or use the gym leco pendulum leg press and I'll put it on the end pin. So we're challenging that shortened range just a little bit more to so mid short. Um, so I'll go across to there and I'll do two, two sets typically one normal, like eight to 10 kind of top set. And then the second set I've been really enjoying just doing something very high rep, really challenging, try and create a continuous aspect to the set. Um, after that leg press set, I feel like I've done a really high rep leg, leg extension kind of set. Um, they're for me, some of the most enjoyable sets on legs. And I, I truly believe that the 25 plus, maybe even 30 plus rep range for legs is does, does, does something special. Um, I see a lot of people with really voluminous legs that have gotten strong at quite high rep ranges, especially with the continuous aspect of, of those sets. Um, so I try in a set, like I did a set of, of 40 on the hammer strength the other day. And I, I basically did 20, a couple of breaths, 10, a couple of breaths, five, and then five. Like it was kind of a rest pause set if you look at it that way. Yeah. Um, but there's no way I could get to 40 without taking a little bit at the top. Um, and the thing is, it's like, I'm essentially with those kind of clusters or high rep sets, I'm getting so many effective reps there. You know, like I'm taking a set like really, really, really close to failure, grabbing some replenishment and taking it again, really close, you know? And then you say these, these people that leave the buffer or the RIR, it's like how many times they actually go there and you know, how many times they actually experience the skill of taking a set that close. And if they're only going there once every mesocycle on a session, that's, that's literally, let's say they run five week mesocycles. Maybe there's 10 times in a year where they're actually learning how to train fucking hard. That's yep. a problem. That's a yeah. big problem. Um, so yeah, two sets on leg press, um, typically two sets on a leg extension. Um, again, I, I kind of I play about with the loading there, depending on how I feel, but it's typically mid, mid short, um, as opposed to anything in the length. And if I load the leg extension on the length and it, it just really smashes my knees, um, and then I'll go across to some form of lunge or split squat variant. Um, typically this ends up being quite glute dominant for me, which works well in the session. Um, and then calves and uh, one set on a doctor. So one set split squat, couple of sets of calves and, uh, you know, one set on the adductor. So, you know, we're looking at around about five quad sets at the moment, two hamstring, one glute, um, and then one direct adductor. So yeah. it's, it's, it's relatively low volume if you look at it like that. And, and, you know, especially with my frequency being every five days. So, you know, so that's what I work with. That's what I can recover from. I think there's points in my off seasons, especially where I can recover from slightly more than that. 
Um, and that's somewhat intuitive in a way. If I feel like my legs are very fresh, I may take an additional set. Um, not typically on the hack because I've, I've, impl- I've deployed such a, a high level of like focus and neural drive into that one set that a back off just would, it wouldn't be the same. It would end up just yeah. creating way too much fatigue for what it's worth, but an extra set on the leg press mm, possible, an extra set on the extension, maybe a drop definitely possible. Um, so that's where I tend to drip feed in my volume. Um, again, I see a lot of these, these, these people that do train with the, the reps in reserve that they do an unbelievable amount of sets on these compound moves. You know, we're talking like four or five sets on the hack yeah. and it's just like, I, I, I just can't perceive how it's possible for, for any of those sets to be at a good relative intensity, because what are you thinking about when you're doing set one, you're thinking about set four. Totally. The only time totally. you're thinking about failure is maybe set four. But you are too, too, too fatigued. Then you're too tired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, <laughs> totally. You're like, uh, I don't want to finish days as fast as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's more of like a, a mental endurance challenge than it is, yeah. all right, how do I take this to maximum intensity? And I, and, you know, my, my perspective, I'm always, I try to be open minded, but when I think about enjoyment, I, 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 that, that just doesn't, doesn't light a fire in, 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 in my head or, or, or my heart. When I go into the gym, I don't want to, I don't want to feel like I'm not passionate about what I'm doing. And, and then, you know, I'm sure it's very similar with you, but the people that follow me, follow me because they like the way that I do things and like the way that I train. So if I was then to prescribe this way of training to them, they would, um, they'd most likely not enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I have no, no clients trained in that manner because none of them want to do it. Um, so, you know, I think when I'm talking about this topic, I'm, 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 I'm obviously passionate about the way that I do things. And I think that the way that I do things is for a reason. And I think there's years of anecdotal data that backs up the way that I perform my training sessions in the physiques that have carried those kind of training sessions. Um, but also I think that, you know, if, if the people that are training in this manner love the way that they train and they like to train in that manner, that we, we can't, we can't, we can't have anything against that because uh, you know, if, if that's the way they truly enjoy things and uh, then that that's what they should do. But I think that those people should also at some point try, you know, give it a shot the other way and, uh, and see if they end up enjoying it. So I had a lot more people come from that side and come to this side and love it. Um, then I have had the other way around. I think um, one of maybe the only things that I've experienced as a coach as a negative of the, the high intensity progressive overload model is that people do run into a little more niggles and pains and discomforts now and again, um, which I think is, uh, is inevitable when you're testing the limits. Um, but I'd also like to hear from those that are doing five sets of hack squats as to how their knees feel, because I think if I was doing five sets of hack and that, even that load exposure over several low intensity sets, I think I'd still be, be probably feeling some discomfort from that. Um, and some niggles because we know how much volume as well as intensity can, can impact our joint health. So, um, so yeah, you know, I think there's, there's two sides to the coin for sure, but that's the way that I train. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, the point is that I realize that we have a bias, me and you, and we that are on that side of the screen that we thought, we think that people, uh, are like us. And in reality, lots yeah. of followers, they don't want to, to, to be bodybuilders. They just want to have fun and the best compromise to have a good physique. So the thing is that a lot of people talked to me and they said, oh, you, you can't train on failure all the time. And I said, have you ever tried that? And they say, yeah, I tried that. I'm, I'm tired all the day after a leg day. I'm so tired, so sore. <laughs> and I, I have to eat a lot to recover. And I have anxiety before the set. And, and I'm <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. that's it that's it so you have to choose if, if you want to have the best result possible you have to follow that path if you don't want you, you can find a compromise it's like uh if you said to me to be a football player 
you know, I want to be a football player and I, I can't do what Cristiano Ronaldo does. I can't. I can train like him because I'm not... I'm not even good at football, to be honest. I mean, Italian, I'm not good at football, I admit it. So I can't do it, but I'm not saying that he's doing wrong. I'm not saying that the way I do train for football to play with friends is the best way possible. Yeah. So, so, so that's the point. It's like, yeah, that's yeah. bodybuilding. That's a sport. If you ever see every athlete in the world, they are sore all the time. They are yeah. lethargic all the time because they train. It's a work. So you have to choose basically. But, yeah. you know, the, the thing is, if you like it, that's the best spot. To you, be. you embrace it. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you're, you're tired, you're lethargic, and you're like, it's working. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Totally, rather, totally. Rather than fighting it, rather and I than admit thinking it's wrong. I admit that's something wrong with me, that I yeah. like to train a failure. I, I'm the wrong one. I admit yeah. it. But that yeah. I think it works. That's yeah. how to push the results as far as you can. Yeah. So... And some people uh, don't need to go to failure because of the genetic. Huh. You know, yeah. so some people are just, I can win what I want to win without going to failure. So what, why do I have to train like that? And it makes sense. It's just yeah. a, a personal, you know, choose. Agreed, 100%. Yeah, and yeah. I think the, the problem is, is the people with maybe subpar genetics and response to training is that they, they feel like they can follow that same path um and uh you know it's, it's a reason why some of the people with crazy transformations uh from average physiques to uh, pretty damn competitive and good physiques are the ones that have earned it you know they, they, they have to, they have to earn it i have to be sending sets they have to be doing uh you know a, an amount of work that will make them feel fatigued when they come to a day of rest you know it's just it's, it's inevitable if you want to really pursue goals that are maybe beyond your true genetic potential um you know i don't i think i've i've been relatively blessed in terms of genetic structure like i've always had quite a small waist so the muscle that i've built has sat well but i've never i was never a muscular kid i was always jealous of other boys that had naturally good abs and vascularity <laughs> and i was never like that i was quite a chubby stocky kind of young boy i was never you know crazy muscular and my response was steady it wasn't crazy fast um i built muscle but it didn't come on crazy quick um i was just yeah i think i, I look at some of my clients i'm like oh, like you know they've got a really slow response coupled with you know quite wide waist and, and narrow clavicles and i'm like oh, you know that's a hard that's a hard one to deal with it's going to take a lot of time to sit the muscle where it needs to sit to enhance yeah. that genetic shape but they still work really hard they work sometimes harder than the people that have got well actually to be honest they work often harder than the people that have got the most blessed insertions and genetic yeah. shape um i think bodyboarding is something that the best the best in the world might be the ones that have you know the genetics and the hard work but often you'll find that you can get people with, you know, mediocre genetics do so well based on hard work, which is why I love the sport. You know, um, you can get pretty damn far if you're willing to put in the hours. Totally, totally agree. Mm. Um, so talking about nutrition, uh, mm. what did you do to uh, all these years uh, to reach your goals? What did you learn through the process? Sure. So like I sort of talked about earlier, I started off with an awareness of like calories and macros uh, from my, my first ever sort of coach. Um, and then from there, I, I, I developed more knowledge again from not only being part of, of uh, Jordan's site, but also, um, you know, nutrition based courses. I did a course called um, Shredded by Science, which I, I don't know oh, what yeah. it's called now, but Shredded by Science, which is great, which has had like 3DMJ doing a lot of the lectures on that one um so that back in the day was a great course to be a part of and uh and then yeah just like over the course of time i you know i, I learned the importance of spending especially for a natural you know a lot long stints in in a steady surplus and an environment of growth um and you know i saw i saw big improvements in terms of uh, my my training performance and my leverage to increase lifts and, and progressively overload when I was super, super on it and consistent with nutrition. Um, and then I went through periods, I think it was after my, my, my first contest prep in 
like 2014, 2015's off season where I definitely maybe went down the route of being a little too meticulous. Like I would, if my, if my parents were going out for a meal, I would like four days, five days in advance, log in the exact meal that I would have into my fitness pal. And I play about my, with my entire day to hit my macros to the absolute gram. Like I've become very obsessive with being absolutely on the money every single day, um, which I'm not saying is a bad thing because it got me good results and I was very consistent. And there's a lot of people that should be more consistent with their nutrition, but I've learned over the course of time to relax a little more, um, to be aware of my, of course, in a contest prep phase, it's the same stuff every single day without fail. But in a off season, let's say we need to go out for a meal, me and Laws and our family, I, I won't be so worried about what calories I'm consuming. I'll go and I'll have a dish that I would like. And whatever my weight is the next day, I know I'll be back to my normal regime following it. And as long as I've got in my calories and my protein, I've probably done a good enough job to suffice for the next day. Um, you know, being that the one meal, you know, but in the past I'd worry about one meal. So I think becoming a little bit more flexible and relaxed has probably been the theme um, for my off seasons. And that's only helped me because it's reduced stress. I used to gather so much stress from not being perfect. Um, so yeah, a bit more flexibility, but ultimately like, I think as naturals, especially, you know, this, this is probably, it's just like, it's, it's our only alongside stress management and sleep. It's like our catalyst for growth is food. And a lot of naturals simply don't are afraid of, of putting in enough food to grow, um, are afraid to push body weight above a certain amount because they're natural and their stage weight will only ever be this or that. Yeah. Um, and something I think, you know, I, I look up to, to, to Keith quite a lot in the sense that he really has always been someone that's preached pushing and is not afraid to, to get heavy in the off season. And, and it's showing, you know, he, I, I actually worked with Keith for one contest season of his um, before he's with his recent coach. And I, I know what his, what his stage weight was back in 2018 when we worked together, his stage weight was 170 pounds. The dude's now 204 pounds with lines in his glutes. That's unbelievable shit. <laughs> yeah. um, that is unbelievable stuff. And the only reason why he's gotten there is because he's been willing to get 50, 60 pounds above his, his stage weight and spend years lifting, well, no less. I don't ever see much less than five plates on a bar for him on anything. Um, and that's, you know... The amount of, if you think about the amount of times he's handled those weights in that time period, that shows in his density, in his look. He's gained muscle maturity that would most people would take five or six years in one or two years because yeah. of the frequency that he's touching those, those heavy, heavy weights. Um, you know, and, and obviously he's, he's someone that's always advocated training very close to the mark in terms of failure but not only that you know doing the low rep sets as well doing the challenging sets that make other sets feel lighter you know um so you know he's he's definitely someone that i look up to and definitely from a nutrition standpoint in terms of pushing the food and just not being afraid of, of really really eating enough to 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 feel what you want to look like um so yeah i i think as naturals often i see is just just people not really pushing body weight and food enough um, and staying in a comfortable range of body fat. But then again, you look at their Instagram feed and you scroll past and they're lifting the same weights they were lifting a year ago, you know, and Absolutely. you wonder why the changes are so insignificant in the physiques is because they're just not, they're not doing stuff that they've not done before in an off season phase. Yeah. Um, that's the catalyst and food's going to probably take you there at some point. So yeah, I'm a big I fan think of pushing. I think most of people underestimate how many, how much food and how many calories do we need as bodybuilders? Yes, it's like, oh, you go to the gym, you just burn a what, a couple of hundred calories, something like that. It's not like that. You mm. need tons of calories, especially because we have to be in a surplus and we have the adaptive thermogenesis on it. So if we stay 3000 calories, then we start burning 3000, then we go to 
we need to go up and then we start burning and then we need to go up and we and so on so we need to push food through all the bulk phase mm -hmm. again and again and again and we, we end up eating a lot and that's yes. the requirement so yeah. um talking about that, your nutrition at the moment uh what what are you eating sure so at the moment I've just come out of a very, very short diet phase that I ran to essentially uh, maybe pre-mediate pre -mediate my prep next year. Um, so we mapped out a little bit of a timeline as to what my off season should look like if I wanted to land in a good start point for next year. Um, inevitably, I, I don't think I'm going to compete next year because this mini diet immediately kicked up way too much diet fatigue for my liking showing that from a physiological set point sort of basis it's like i hadn't fully recovered from my prep um which i kind of thought anyway but i wanted to um i wanted to to learn i wanted to try it i wanted to to, to experience what i thought would be the case and i was right and a lot of the time this is something that's actually good feedback because a lot of the time your intuition when you've been doing this for 10 years your intuition is pretty good. You know what's going to happen when you do something. You know when your body's ready to respond to a diet and you also know when it's not. Um, so yeah, my, my calories are relatively low at this point, around about three and a half thousand calories on a training day um, and around about 2,900, 3,000 on a rest day. Um, my food at peak off season, well, the, the highest that I ever got was just before last year's prep. Um, and that was in that 20, 2020 at end of prep, uh, which I wasn't so happy with the condition in 2020. So it was kind of like starting from quite a lean composition rather than stage lean, which is very different, <laughs> very different. The recovery curve, recovery curve is just so completely, completely different. It takes so much longer to recover when you're, when you're in real true shape, as you know. Um, so yeah, my food got up to like 4,700 on training days and about 4,200 on rest days. But I also was the strongest and probably the best that I'd ever looked at that weight off season. Um, and my appetite was ravenous. It was ridiculous. It was in such a good spot. Um, and something that I actually really do recommend for people that do struggle with appetite in the off season. Some of the things that helped me at that point was um, just generally not being lazy and mo still moving. Um, so I was still doing like short little walks after bigger meals, keeping cardio in, um, and also using like literally one of the biggest tools. I know it sounds little, but like using a glucose disposal agent, um, yeah. using something like Strom's Glycomax, uh, or some, I'm sure there's some other good products in Italy that people can get, but using something like that as a natural, um, I actually think that it's one of the most, one of the most beneficial subs you can use when your food's very high. Yeah. Um, I've seen great improvements in appetite. And of course, if we're tracking blood glucose, insulin sensitivity tends to take a, you know, a significantly good hit. Um, and we just partition nutrients better. Um, you know, when you're partitioning better, your looks can be better. Your digestion is mostly going to improve. You, you're going to have that readiness for meals. You're not creating so much stress going into a meal thinking, oh. fuck, I'm going to finish this. So, um, yeah, that was probably like the best point in off season for me, but you know, and that, that's like, like under, like just under 200 pounds eating like best part of like late fours, um, which a lot of people just don't, I, I don't see many naturals get much above four when I read yeah. what people are doing Instagram on Instagram. I, mean, I see a lot of people, like you said, in that comfy range about yeah. 3000 calories, like their off season is 3000 calories. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> why you know like uh, sure surely you know your what tends to happen i think is people get to a body weight where they are comfortable and the training's good they look pretty good yeah they've got good food they've got maybe a nice little bit of detail to their abs and they're like okay this is good this is off season yeah. but you know is it you know is it, it, it the people that really do come down and this is something with my clients, the people that come down, you know, looking so different are the people that do really, really sort of take it until their body starts giving them some kickback, you know, starts saying, I don't want to push anymore because you've pushed it really hard. You've pushed it to 
the limit of, of an off-season potential. And you, yeah. That's with managing all of the other variables. It's not like you've exactly. sucked at managing your sleep or stress. It's You've managed all of them and your body's still saying no. You've probably at that point hit your, your, you know, your, your threshold and you've challenged your body as much as you can. Um, and that's your point to maybe turn the table on either a prep or a mini diet, um, depending on how long you want to push through that. Cause, uh, some of, some of the pushing there has got to be done, especially if you're on a great run of training. Um, so yeah. And you'll find at that point, even as a natural, you know, um, your best part of your day will be getting to the gym because the rest of the day won't feel brilliant, but, uh, getting into the gym, you'll feel, like you can crush it. And that's something that I definitely learned from training with assisted athletes, um, especially on a frequent basis. I trained with Cuba for like a whole year in one of his most productive back ends of one of his most productive off seasons where he really, really pushed it. Um, and I remember him just always saying, you know, I, I feel so like horrible today and full. And, and then I'd like go around his house and spend some time with him and see him eat the amount of food that he eats and, I'd be like, fuck, this is, this. what if I do this? What if, what if <laughs> like, I try and do this shit as well and, and eat, eat plenty and push myself as hard? Because I'd never really pushed an off-season that hard, and then I did. And funnily enough, the results came, you know? So, um, you know, natural should not be afraid of really pushing those limits. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, do you think that Instagram and socials play a role in that? I mean, I, I think most of people are like, okay, I have a good physique. You know, you can see veins, abs, and stuff like that. I can't be choppy because I, I'm not going to have more uh, visuals or likes and stuff like that. So I think it's the, the dream they are selling, like uh, lean bulk. <laughs> and, and I said, I always said, trying to think about the body fat and try to to uh, stay as lean as possible during a bull phase. It's like having sex, trying not to sweat. You know, <laughs> you don't care about sweating. You're just having yeah. sex. You're just yeah. banging, you know. Yeah. Uh, you don't care about body fat. I mean, you, yeah. you don't have to be obese, of course. But, I mean, that's fine to, to, yeah. to have some point more of body fat. You, you have to focus on the training. Yes. Yeah, 100%. You know, I think social media plays a role. I think people want to look a certain way. I think people want to look marketable. I also think people just, they they don't like feeling uncomfortable, you know? They have a lot of things maybe going on in their life where, I don't know, they're trying to look a certain way for their partner yeah. or they're trying to look a certain way to fit into a mold around their friends. And they don't want to be this person that looks puffy or watery and, and bloated sometimes you know they, they don't like that kind of that that look uh, especially if you've been contest lean because you get attached to that, that look that you have when you're contest lean you take lots of pictures you like the way everything looks because everything looks better when you're fucking contest lean of course it does yeah. but um you know you've you got to come away from that detach yourself from that feeling and and focus on on what's going down on the gym floor um you know if anything if, if what's going down on the gym floor is very samey and you can expect to look very samey. And if you're comfortable with that, fine, you know, but yeah, I know for fun. myself, I'm not, you know, um, when things are samey in the gym, I, I, I hate it. I, I don't like it. If I'm, if I'm meant to be improving, I'm meant to be doing better stuff in the gym. So, you know, that's, that's always my goal. And, and that really helps me detach from what my physique might look like for, for what will be a, relatively short period of time even in a longer off season it's, it's not going to be long until i probably you know diet down you know in the grand scheme of things um so yeah i think people just need to be more accepting of that totally what do you think about flexible dieting like if you fit your macros and <laughs> not a huge fan as a whole um obviously you know one of the things i said there was being a bit more flexible with nutrition but i think it goes a little too far with a lot of people like my off season diet, apart from when we have meals out occasionally will be the same stuff every day because I know what's going to digest. Well, I know what's going to create regular training performance. The issue with flexible dieting and using like, I, I can't remember the last time I've logged onto my fitness pal. The issue with my fitness pal and logging your food on there is that you, you eat with no structure. You eat with, 
you eat like a weird person that's just trying to just fit stuff in. Yeah. You know, bodybuilding is not about fitting stuff in. Bodybuilding is about eating on time, eating your meals and having structured your day because everything else in your day should be structured if you're a bodybuilder you should be probably getting up at the same time going to bed at the same time and drinking the same amount of water roughly per day and the more you have structure the better your day will operate as a bodybuilder so you know i think that's i i think flexibility when it comes to the diet in terms of food options changing every day and nah it's just not for me um and in a prep scenario in my opinion as much as some people are against meal plans I think the food focus is obscene with tracking macros because people just think about what they can fit in and they walk around the supermarket looking at the back of packets on every single item. And it's, I've been there, done that, you know, um, yeah, yeah, when I, too. yeah, when I first, when I first learned about nutrition, it was like, right, here are your macros go and track. So, it's, and then that turned into a bit of a nightmare for me at points when the calories got low. So it's not something that I favor. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Um, I want to touch something else because uh, th there's something that Alex told me about you that uh, mm -hmm. concerning uh, your lifestyle. I mean, sure. uh, we, we are talking about uh, hours in general. Mm -hmm. And he told me that you go to sleep really early, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, really, really early. <laughs> yeah, really, really early. Uh, I think last night was half seven and <laughs> pretty it's, it's pretty consistently between about half seven and and seven um so for, for me the sleeping early is because i love to wake early uh, um i've always been someone that likes to kind of get ahead of the day i like the silence in the morning of like having just a, a specific focus so for me the way my business works is a lot of my, well, pretty much all of my clients, they check in the day before they get their feedback. So the check-ins come in at any point during, for example, today or Wednesday, the check-ins all come in today that are going to be fed back for tomorrow morning. Um, they'll typically come in the afternoon. That's the way that people do them in the afternoon, evening. So then when I wake up in the morning at like 4.30, I've got all of my workload right in front of me. So I just get to work. Um, and it's, it's a day, it's a point in the day, you know, when I've got no distractions, you know, I'm not that I'd like to get distracted, even if it was later in the day, but I, I have very limited distractions. Um, no one messaging me at that point, apart from maybe some international clients. And it's just like, right, head down and work. And that means that by the time I roll into my time, my pre-workout meal and my training, it's like the, the work's done. The main bulk of my work up for the day check-ins wise is, is completed so uh reduces stress and it's just a routine that i've i've i've, I've quite liked to adopt uh, yeah. um not to say that it might not change in the future or something like that but um for for now it works and it only works as well because obviously my partner loss does the exact same thing as me so um it fits it fits her routine and lifestyle as well so i appreciate that Uh, not a lot of people can always make that work because people have different jobs and come home at maybe 6 p.m. and you'd only get half an hour to see your partner. So it doesn't work for a lot of people, but luckily it works for me. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree because uh, I go to sleep really early too. Not as you, but mm. uh, 8.39, we are sleeping. Mm. And we like to wake up really early for the same reason. Yes. Uh, actually having a walk with the dog. So uh, we have a Doberman and she's really, really active. So we prefer to go in the park when nobody's here. Because sure. she tends to run and try to play with everybody and some people get scared. So it's, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so that's the reason. And then, uh, and also uh, another, another reason is that you can work without distraction and nobody is texting you, no thoughts. You just go and it's like a stream of consciousness. And yeah. uh, uh, can you walk us through your typical day? Because I, I know mm -hmm. uh, we talk about timing of uh, food, and I think that's really important. Because when you track your um, when you track your macros, you you lost that part that you have to have some feedback of your nutrition and say, okay, I have to push food where, sure. what, mm. 
It's not just pushing calories in your day. It's where do I have to push calories and what do I have to? Uh, it, it, there is a huge difference between hot and cream of rice, yes. for example. So yes. that's the point. So what's your typical day? How do you organize to, uh, I think, have a peak of performance in gym and works everything perfect? Sure. So wake up uh, about half four. Um, if I'm doing cardio, I will do cardio. If I'm not doing cardio, I will basically just make a coffee, one and a half liters of water, bring it up to my desk. I'll have the coffee, have sip on the water um, and get after my, my morning of work, my check-ins. Typically that's like, so that ends up by the time I, I'm ready and I've got upstairs about 5 a.m. I then typically work for about two hours um, straight up doing check-ins responses uh, to my clients and to my, to my team, um, covering any important emails, et cetera, but it's mostly just check-ins from that period of time. Then I'll go downstairs around about seven o'clock, have meal one, which at the moment is still lots of just lots of vegetables um, and red meat. And then I will come back upstairs. Uh, I'll work for another good block, another two hour block um, before I have meal two. Meal two will normally be like rice, chicken, veggies. Um, and at the moment, I've just added fats back into that meal. So normally some almond butter with that. Then I'll come back upstairs and then obviously in instance of today, it might be a podcast, but by that point, I'm usually like, maybe I've got like two check-ins left. So I've done about maybe four, four and a half hours, maybe five hours or so of work, just check-in based. Um, and then I'll do, you know, whether it be admin, content creation, getting back to messages, I maybe will go on Instagram and just check DMs and things like that. Um, but I tend to, well, I won't go on Instagram until after meal two, basically that's my rule. So that then I don't get any distraction until I've done all of my check-ins. Um, and then round about half 11-ish, I'll eat pre-meal, be in the gym by half 12, one, be started off my session by one, half one. Um, uh, my pre-meal at the moment is oats, whey, blueberries and dark chocolate. I've had that for a while. Um, that will probably be something like rice flakes in the future or cream of rice if my digestion is a little slower on oats, but at the moment it's fine. Um, intra, normally have some carbs intra with the AAs. We finish training and then we'll come home and by about half, it'll be about half four or five by then. Um, and then I have rice flakes again, more uh, frozen blueberries, raspberries and whey protein post-workout. Um, and then I will tend to just try and relax as much as I can, maybe go for a little bit of walk, do an Instagram post. If I've done anything cool in the gym or if I've got something to talk about, um, and then, uh, I'll post that. Um, and then, yeah, just shower, eat my last meal and, and the phone will be away by that point for the last meal. Um, so I'll be upstairs with my alarm set. So I don't have any distractions in the evening. And I just sit downstairs with Lars and we watch something on Netflix and there'll be no phones allowed at that point. So no noise, no social media, just watching something on TV, like a series um, and eating the last meal, which again, at the moment is oats and uh, oats whey. Um, some, again, some more fruit. I have a lot of fruit in my diet um, and then some fat sauce normally, typically again from almond butter. Um, so yeah, my, my diet at the moment, to be honest, like, I can withstand quite a good amount of just whole foods for a long, long time. Um, I, I tend to, when my appetite gets bad is when I start to put in too much processed stuff. Yeah. When I start to put in like loads of like bread or bagels and lots of jam and things like that, when I get lazy or lazier with my food, sometimes my appetite actually ends up getting worse. Um, so I, I try and hold on to just my basic whole foods for as long as I can and just increase them steadily. Maybe add in some little bits. Like I have like things like a uh, dark chocolate covered rice cakes and things like that, which are quite dense, but easy yeah. whole, like, still relatively whole foods to eat. Um, but just a little, little bit different texture, which I find helps. Um, and, but other than that, my diet is, you know, very, very sort of like clean, so to speak, yeah. uh for, for the majority of off season as long as i can keep it that way 
Um, I find this also keeps my skin healthy as well. Um, if I, again, if I go down the process route too much, I, uh, I, my skin breaks out and skin health as a bodybuilder, of course, is, is something you want to really try and take, take care of when you can. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much my, my day. And then, and like I said, we'll sort of, you know, watch maybe an hour, an hour and a half of Netflix or so, and then, and then head to bed. Um, I think that, that, that evening time is so important. A lot of people just don't give themselves any time to calm down and relax off a busy day. And then they wonder why they can't get to sleep or switch off in the evenings. And, uh, that'll be the reason why is that they're just constantly on their phone or socials or scrolling until they go to bed. And then that's, you know, that's a lot of noise for your head to try and compartmentalize before you go to bed. Yeah. So, yeah, totally. Um, so last, last thing uh, is about contest prep. How sure. do you, uh, what do you do? What have you learned through the years uh, about how to, you know, do a contest prep, uh, training wise and nutrition wise both? Sure. So I think the biggest thing from a training standpoint, contest prep is just, I, I you know, I, I always try to do too much in the past. Uh, I'd actually diet down and, and increase volume. Um, because I thought that I'd be burning more calories with my sessions and that I'd be creating more of a demand and, and, uh, you know, you feel fitter. So you feel like you can do more, but in reality, the best thing to do is most likely being doing le less, you know, your recovery capacity is going down and, you know, you want to limit your load exposure a little bit so that you're managing fatigue and you're just getting a more responsive body. And Hey, presto, you know, last year I did that. My volume came down. I managed my load exposures better um, and uh, boom, you know, best prep that I've probably ever done in terms of getting into condition. Um, so that's the main thing with training and, and just, you know, being aware of, of not getting too emotionally attached to exercises and the logbook and being on like understanding when I need to drop the load to maintain the same stimulus that I created with a heavier load um, when I was also heavier in body weight. And then with regards to nutrition, So I think one of the biggest things that I, I have learned with my own preps is just being a little bit more assertive at the start, obviously giving myself a lot of time, but being more assertive at the front end and then being able to pull off and back off at the back. Um, I think in most of my contest preps before last year, I was way too protective of calories at the start. I'd make like small adjustments that would lead to a rate of loss, but it would be quite small. Um, so I've been really quite like assertive out of the gates with my more recent preps, like losing closer to that, like 1% of my total body weight and ensuring that really out of the gate, ensuring that I've created the deficit and that I'm getting some momentum built. Um, and then being able to have a timeline that allows me to back off towards the end and almost run, you know, a peak week that maybe lasts three weeks in length, um, basically just feeding up steadily into the show. Um, and that has produced the, the best, the best peaks and the best looks that I've had so far is when I've really been able to like steadily remove fatigue. So yeah, for me, it'd be a case of being, you know, assertive out the gate, um, not being afraid to, to drop food when I need to and, and go on to low calories. If, if that's what, what's required to get the job done. Um, and then for future reference, I, I think knowing when, knowing when I've, brought as much fat as I can get off like actually knowing that because I still don't um I still struggle with that when I'm actually in really good shape I still struggle with understanding that I've actually hit my capacity in terms of getting fat off I need to focus on then just protecting the level of fullness that I have um and not continuing to try and strive for more and more and more and more body fat off um Because that's kind of what I did last year is I hit really good condition, like condition enough that followed. I was like, well, if I want to win these, I just need to get leaner. And that wasn't really the answer. I just needed to actually just keep a low fatigue state and just keep getting slowly better by being fresh. Um, when instead I just put myself into more of a deficit, increased my output and lost muscle fullness. And as a result, just looked smaller and, and flatter at those preceding shows. Um, so I, I just need to, yeah, learn when to, to back off slightly. And that's the main thing. That, that's the post. Yeah. That, that's quite impressive. Mm. It's, it's totally good. <laughs> it, it is, I think, the most challenging thing and the most difficult thing 
to understand <laughs> and realize where to when to back off, when to start feeling up, and when when you can push further. Yeah. And I mean, I, all, yeah. all that I looked at there was that uh, in the time I was like, right, what is it? My um, right glute wasn't as lean as my left. That's all I could see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Uh, the judges can't see that shit either. Like when you've got your trunks on and the, you know, you can see the outer edge of glute lines from 10 feet away from the stage. You're the judges, unless you've got glutes like Ben Howard, you're they're not going to see those deep crevices in your glutes. Like they're going to be able to see, okay, good hamstring detail, good, like lat development. And if you wash away all of that for the sake of one more glute line, you just, you're, all you're doing is just taking away from from the end look so yeah that's i think the that's the point the compromise between fullness yes. and that little detail is that sometimes you can push further but if yep. you do you, you just stand like a melted candle you know you implode <laughs> and yep. and that's the main yep. risk well, I think it's a lot of trial and error. I mean, uh, the, the first uh, preps, the first competitions are like uh, uh, a list of what not to do. So I have not to do this, not to do this, not to do this, stuff like that. And at the end, you understand how to manage yourself and get experience. And th th that's quite impressive, that uh, change, I think. And uh, you, that was 10 weeks out and one week out, right? So what did you do? You, you just yes. keep pushing yeah. and you drop calories again. Correct. Yeah, just keep pushing. And I and I went on to pretty low food, if I'm honest, to get that off. Um, like, you know, my 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 carbs were just literally like 50 grams of oats pre-training and 50 grams of oats post workout. Um, and I think I had like 15 grams of carbs intra. So and the rest was just like trace from from vegetables so it was, it was it was it was low low food um and the rate of loss was fairly decent as well to to get to get that rest of the bit of the fat off and then like i said you know just the struggle for me realistically is just you know okay the job's done stop i mean i just need to get much much better at yeah yeah, uh, I've done a post uh, on Instagram yesterday talking about the condition on stage. And what I, I've said is, uh, what I think is that the, it's not that you have to push at all costs. But the yeah. point is that the most impressive athletes on stage in terms of condition are the ones that can manage that much stress of weeks and weeks of low food. Yes. If you can manage that, if, we, if you can go to the gym each day and push like hell, without eating nothing, basically, then you can get the condition. If you can't, it's not worth it. You know, yep. you just end up like imploding yourself. Agreed. So, Agreed. And I think it takes years to, to manage how to deal with uh, hunger and all the, the shit feelings on, on prep. I told you the first year I came here, I told you that you look smiley during the prep. And it's yeah. so strange because uh, everybody are like sad during prep, like depressed, and yeah. all this stuff. But you look smiley, so I think that's the game changer. You you just yeah. enjoy <laughs> the process. I, I I do I do love the process when I'm in the right frame of mind, um, and I I've got a deep desire about getting on stage. I absolutely love it. When I'm when I've got no desire about dieting and I'm dieting and I'm losing strength, I hate it. Um, I yeah. look the opposite in the gym um so you know i think it's it, the biggest thing is just desire you've absolutely got to have that like deep burn inside of you to get up there and 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 you know win you know do well compete to you know be your personal best whatever it is the desire absolutely needs to be there so without that you can't have that you know same smiliness passion etc that that you may see some people have and it de definitely like you said it's a learned skill i definitely didn't look like that in my first first ever prep um so yeah and it's just it's bodybuilders think that it's inevitable that you just need to be upset and draggy and depressed during dieting so they create that 
personality. They create that identity with prep dragginess. Whereas if you flick it on its head and you think prep, I feel fitter, I feel healthier, I look great. Boom, yeah. suddenly a positive. So it's that it's, it's as bad as you make it, really. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, mate. Uh I think we are done. a uh, lot of content, a lot of uh, advice from you. So thank Pleasure. you a lot for coming. I really appreciate it. And uh, are you going to train now? Uh yes, we Later. have we have legs. Yes, so it should be a good one today. Okay. I'm looking okay. forward to it. Okay. <laughs> Hope that this little talking uh, drives you well into the gym. <laughs> Absolutely will, man. Absolutely will. Okay. It's a pleasure. So thanks again and uh, enjoy your session and we meet at the gym uh... soon, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I'm, I'm training in the morning now. So I know you are, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. But what time anyway, do you end up finishing? Uh, no, really early. We're, we're going now at 7 o'clock, so we end ah. up at 9, 10 depends and no, because of the time. traffic mostly right we, okay we take a lot of traffic going uh, in uh, the middle of the morning so we decide to go earlier but that I, makes sense is the gym nice and quiet at that time as well yeah it is it is mm. <laughs> i'm jealous i'm jealous <laughs> maybe one day deep, i'll change yeah. to that setup because that sounds that sounds inviting sometimes yeah. i get annoyed waiting for stuff you know what it's like yeah that's great if you All do right, man, yeah. we'll catch up soon Yeah, for sure. See you in a bit. Thank you. See ya.